Hey everybody, I want to talk about why Chris Kresser is awful. Now I want to point out that I really hate making these videos. I'm talking to a computer screen. I really prefer to talk to other people, other human beings. So if you like this video and think it would be an interesting podcast to have, please invite me. I've just recently started getting into being on podcasts and I've done pretty well. Check out the podcast with Keto Geek. Uh, it should be released in the next couple of days, and then you should have a good idea of how well I do on podcasts, and there should be a bunch of other new podcasts coming out as well with me on them. So without further ado, I want to talk about why Chris Kresser is awful, and again, I hate making this video, but I'm doing it because Chris Kresser is uh, going to be on the Joe Rogan show. The fact that he's on Joe Rogan show with such consistency is very alarming to me because he's awful, and now I'm going to explain why. If I can figure out how to make my screen work. Okay, the diet heart myth, the cholesterol and saturated fat are not the enemy. I'm gonna go talk about why Chris Kresser is awful through the prism of this particular article. There's a bunch of different articles on his website that are really horrendous. They're, uh, they're not really worth talking about or addressing, but because he's going on the Joe Rogan podcast and he's gonna be in front of millions of people, it's important to point out that the stuff that he writes and the stuff that he believes is generally ridiculous. So, uh, first thing that is on his article is this fact check symbol. It makes the article look authoritative. In fact, his whole website looks very slick and well designed uh, in a similar way. So, fact check, what does that mean? Fact checked. It means that each article is created by a subject matter expert or professional research assistant on our writing team and is thoroughly reviewed by our staff. What does that mean? Well, that means that the people he's paying are the people who's fact-checking him. That doesn't sound like a fact-check to me. That sounds like rubber stamping. And he doesn't even talk about his methodology, even if uh, it wasn't uh, entirely dependent upon his money, the, this particular fact-checking. So I would take this fact-checking with a grain of salt. Basically, just it's marketing. Uh, the first, I think, paragraph, or maybe the second paragraph, says something like, the World Health Organization has estimated blah, blah, blah. I want to point out that he cites the World Health Organization because that's going to become really relevant later because he's also going to uh, disagree with the World Health Organization later. Why does he agree with the, uh, the World Health Organization now but disagree with the World Health Organization later? What methodology does he use to decide when to agree and to disagree with the World Health Organization? And one of the points that I'm going to make about Chris Kresser is he doesn't have a methodology. He picks and chooses whatever whatever article, whatever source that's going to support his views, and then he rejects or ignores the others. And then he um, he also distorts and misrepresents different scientific papers um, in order to do the same. I'm not sure if I highlighted this. It might be in the next slide. It's not. Um, but basically, this last sentence here as well, a recent study which looked at the relationship between heart disease and lifestyle suggested that 90% of cardiovascular disease is caused by modified diet and risk factors, lifestyle factors. I thought that was very interesting. Uh, I didn't actually fact check that particular point, but it's really interesting to note that um, since this article is about the diet heart myth, cholesterol and saturated fat are not the enemy, and it's actually going to address um, the fact that cholesterol is not the enemy, even of blood cholesterol levels. It's, like it's going to address a lot of other things that are similar to that um, because saturated fat and dietary cholesterol raise blood cholesterol levels. It's very interesting that the study that they talked about sh showed that the most important factor in uh, cardiovascular disease risk is elevated ApoB over A1, which is basically, it's kind of a surrogate or it's roughly represents LDL over HDL, um, which is cholesterol. It means high LDL cholesterol, low HDL cholesterol ratio, roughly speaking. And that's interesting because, well, this study, the very first study that he's quoting here actually shows that high blood cholesterol is important for cardiovascular disease and here's one graph from that particular paper and it shows that of the risk factors that they looked at including smoking diabetes hypertension and able b over a1 uh, also b c psychosocial stress um, able b over a1 is actually the most important risk factor you can see it's slightly more important than smoking and it's very interesting because uh, dietary cholesterol and saturated fat raise LDL levels and will raise the ApoB to A1 ratio as we will see momentarily. 
And the reason this particular study decided to use that methodology, according to them, is they said the apoblipoprotein lipoprotein concentrations were not affected by fasting status of the individual, unlike calculated LDL. So they used this instead of LDL. Basically, they're acknowledging that LDL is important. That's why the they might have used it in this particular study looking at cardiovascular disease, but instead they looked at ApoB. Again, the very first study that he cites acknowledges that LDL cholesterol is important for cardiovascular disease. So he's citing these studies to support his point, but they're actually supporting another point, which is that blood cholesterol is important for cardiovascular disease risk. Uh, then he writes that cardiovascular disease is one of the most misdiagnosed and mistreated conditions in medicine. We've learned a tremendous amount of what causes heart disease over the past decade, but the medical establishment is still operating on outdated science for 50 years ago. Um, Chris doesn't actually provide any evidence to support that that we are we're operating on outdated science from, from um, 40 to 50 years ago to diagnose and treat uh, uh, cardiovascular disease. I have a lot of friends who work in cardiology and they're constantly using new technologies, new diagnosis, um, not new, new diagnostic modalities, and uh, new science to understand cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular disease risk. And I don't think Chris Kresser is a cardiologist. And I don't actually think he knows anything that he's talking about here. He says, the diet heart hypothesis, which holds that eating cholesterol and saturated fat raises cholesterol in the blood, originating studies in both humans and animals more than a half a century ago. However, more recent and higher quality evidence doesn't support it. So, so he's saying that recent, recent evidence doesn't support that eating cholesterol and saturated fat raises cholesterol in the blood. That's false. It's like just false. It's not even disputed. It's not like, it's like a solid finding. Like it's rock solid. It's a hundred percent certain that he is absolutely wrong. So um, I'm going to show that. It's like, it's not even like on this level of like, oh yeah, is, is meat, is eating meat good or bad? It's not like an opinion thing like that. It's not like, um, is eating only a vegan diet good or bad? Is eating, uh, uh, is atheros, well, is like, are, are vegetables, eating a lot of vegetables good or bad? Is like, is eating red meat good or bad? Is eating fruits good or bad it's not like that where there's there's some wiggle room and there's substantial uncertainty about what is good or bad there uh, it's more along the lines of like if i drop if i drop this uh i don't know what this is a lid on my the drink that i use it's you know whatever if i drop it uh will it hit the ground and the answer is yes and it's with that level of certainty that we know that dietary cholesterol and saturated fat raises heart disease risk. So, so the point I want to make before demonstrating this is that Chris Kresser doesn't just spread pseudoscience that's like, oh, does this guy really believe that? Is he really believe that? Does he really convince that? How is he convinced that this particular weird pseudoscientific thing that he believes, um, how is he convinced that that's true? It's more like, how did he just write that? Like, did he really just write that? This is one of the most ridiculous things I've ever read. And so many of the things that Chris Kresser writes are like that. They're absolutely ridiculous. It's not within the realm of science and he doesn't know what he's talking about. So let me now demonstrate that. So he talks about cholesterol feeding studies where they're feeding volunteers two to four eggs a day measuring their cholesterol and shows little impact on blood cholesterol about 75% of the population. That's true, actually. So the remaining 25% of the population are known as hyper responders. In this group, dietary cholesterol does modestly raise both LDL and HDL but it does not affect the ratio of LDL to HDL or increase the risk of heart disease. So in order to, to check that particular claim, I decided to read the paper that he cited. Let's look at the conclusions of that paper and see if that's what is, that, if that if those support what Chris is saying or if he's cherry picking. It says the conclusions, it is reasonable to conclude that there is little evidence supporting major association between dietary cholesterol and cardiovascular disease risk in the general population. Okay, however, dietary cholesterol may have detrimental effects on uh, coronary heart disease among hyper responders and people with type 2 diabetes. Now remember, as he said, that's 25% of people have are hyper responders, and I think up to 10% of people are diabetic, so we're talking a third of the population. Future uh, studies of the relationship between cholesterol and coronary heart disease should not only consider the individual response type as the important factor, but also evaluate the role of genetics, blah, blah, blah. And, but here's the kicker. At present, the current guidelines on, cardiovas on dietary cholesterol remain sound. Now, why would those 
guidelines telling you to limit your dietary cholesterol be sound according to this paper that he's citing to say that dietary cholesterol is not important. That's very interesting. It's very interesting that the paper he's citing to say dietary cholesterol is not important is telling us to keep the current guidelines of dietary cholesterol below 300 milligrams per day per person in the dietary guidelines. There's some discrepancy here. Let's see why. As it says, 15 to 25 percent of the population is sensitive to dietary cholesterol, and it appears to have an important influence on LDL cholesterol, whereas its effect on HDL is similar between hyporesponders and hyperresponders, meaning in the hyperresponders, LDL is disproportionately raised. Now we saw in the, that that paper earlier that talked about the ApoB to A1 ratio. That is basically, uh, roughly speaking, a surrogate for LDL over HDL. Now. In this particular case, whenever you have LDL raised disproportionately to HDL, that means you are raising the ApoB to A1 ratio. In that particular paper, the, A to the ApoB to A1 ratio was the largest risk factor and the most important risk factor in determining cardiovascular disease risk. So what this is saying, and if this is consistent with that paper, and it is, what this is saying is that this could be really important for cardiovascular disease risk and up to 25% of the population. And that's why this particular paper says, hey, unless you know if you're a hyper-responder or hypo-responder, it's a good idea to uh, eat a low amount of dietary cholesterol. That's why those dietary guidelines are there for everybody. And of course, they were recently removed and there's some controversy about that, but that that's the rationale of the paper. It's not as clear as saying, oh, dietary cholesterol is not important. No, for 25% of the population, it is important. And for that 25% of the population, they need to be careful. And since most people don't know where they are, if they're in that 75% of the population or in that 25% of the population, the dietary guidelines say to limit the amount of cholesterol you consume. So it's a little more nuanced than he's than he's arguing in this particular article, and that's characteristic of pretty much everything he writes. Let's continue. meta regression analysis of the effects of dietary cholesterol intake on LDL and HDL cholesterol. Um, the reason I'm bringing this up is because there's a, a recent article in December of 2018 that does a meta-analysis looking at the effects of dietary cholesterol on blood cholesterol levels. And the interesting thing here is they quantify the rise in blood cholesterol based on the, uh, the baseline intake of, of dietary cholesterol. So if you have a low intake of dietary cholesterol, let's look at the graph, low intake of dietary cholesterol, and then you change your cholesterol to a substantial amount, you're gonna get more of an increase than if you have a high baseline, um, than if you have a high baseline intake. So the idea here is, is that the, if you already have a high amount of dietary cholesterol that you're taking in and you take in more cholesterol, your, dietary, your blood cholesterol is not gonna rise that much. Whereas if you have a low amount of baseline cholesterol and then you start taking dietary cholesterol, you get quite a jump. And this has been observed by many clinicians. I don't know if this has been formally studied in the literature um, in, a, in an experiment yet, but th that's indicated by this kind of graph or some sort of relationship like that is indicated by this kind of graph. So the idea is in general on a population level, you either want to consume a little or as much as cholesterol as you want or zero. But once you consume a little bit of cholesterol, dietary cholesterol, that accounts for basically all of the effects of that amount of dietary cholesterol and anything above that amount of dietary cholesterol that you would consume. So once you consume a little bit of dietary cholesterol, you're not gonna increase it much more above that level of that small amount of dietary cholesterol, if that makes sense. So that's why vegans, um, I think I've just said this, but that's why vegans, when they start eating dietary cholesterol, often they'll see a big jump in their dietary cholesterol, but whereas omnivores who regularly already eat dietary cholesterol, whenever they start eating more dietary cholesterol, they're not gonna see that much of a jump. So that's what this is basically referencing. So it's a little bit nuanced than he's talking about. And actually the factors involved in determining who's a hyporesponder and hyperresponder have not been worked out. Um, I've looked at quite a few papers and uh, there's, and to my knowledge, that's still a mystery even as of 2019 but it could be based on baseline uh, intake of dietary cholesterol. Okay, anyway, what about saturated fat he talks about? It's true that some studies show that saturated fat raises blood cholesterol levels, but these studies are always almost, almost always short-term, lasting only a few weeks. Is that true? Well, first of all, I do want to talk about these short-term studies, and he cites this paper from like 2005, which is outdated, and it is by Ronald Mincing, but 
there's a much newer one, and I think this is from a couple years ago. It's called Effects of Saturated fat, Fatty Acids, Serum Lipids, and Lipoprotein Systematic Review and Regression Analysis. And this is with the World Health Organization. Organization. So it's very interesting how Chris wants to cite the World Health Organization in one thing, but in this particular case where the World Health Organization is saying, hey, saturated fats actually do have a really important effect on serum lipids and lipoproteins according to this meta-analysis, um, Chris is just going to ignore that. So let's look at what this meta-analysis says. There's 91 studies included in this meta-analysis, so 91 randomized controlled trials, and I want to show you one particular table that's particularly interesting. Based on these clinical trials, they were aggregated and then it was averaged or figured out exactly uh, on the aggregate level what the replacement of a, a given amount of saturated fat with a given amount of carbohydrate, monounsaturated fat, and polyunsaturated fat was on total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, HDL, triglycerides, all these other uh, different uh, lip, lipid markers. And actually there's a whole lot more than this. This is only one part of the table I couldn't include in the entire, or I could, but I just it, it, it's not important. There's like 15 of them. But it, it's important to note that whenever you substitute saturated fat for carbohydrate, you get a drop in LDL cholesterol. When you substitute monounsaturated fat for carbohydrate, you get a bigger drop. And when you saturated, you, you substitute polyunsaturated fat for, for saturated fat, you get the largest drop of all, actually about twice as much as the drop for um, carbohydrate. And if you do this to a very large degree, you can see quite a large drop. I don't know if it's linear in the sense that the more saturated fat you replace with polyunsaturated fat, or you're going to get a continuous decline. I don't think that's the case, but I think that there is a substantial relationship between these two in these short-term trials. Now, he points out that, um, it, you know, these studies are almost always short-term, only lasting a few weeks. Is that true? Let's, so let's point out one of the studies in this particular meta-analysis lasts 91 days, and actually that found a, a substantial effect of uh, saturated fat on blood cholesterol levels. In fact, many of the studies lasted 50 days, 30 days, 60 days. So it's not a, a, a true at all that most, almost all of these studies lasted only a few weeks. That's false. But even if that's true, um, let's still look further what he uses to support his view. Before we do that, I want to talk about his understanding of nutritional epidemiology. So he's very skeptical of nutritional epidemiology. He says you should be skeptical of the latest nutrition gut headlines. And he quotes Peter Atiyah. He says nutritional epidemiology is basically the board game equivalent of a Ouija board, whatever you want to say it will say. And he says the um, observational studies are hypothesis generating, not proof, right? So you need randomized controlled trials to prove anything. Well, in his paragraph, he cites observational studies in order to argue the point that saturated fat does not have any role in blood cholesterol levels. He says, in fact, of all the long-term studies examining this issue, only one of them showed a clear association for saturated fat and intake and cholesterol levels, and even that association was weak. What does he mean by association? Is he looking at randomized controlled trials or is he looking at observational studies? He's actually looking at observational studies. So he's looking at a, a blog post posted by Stefan Guine, Stefan Guine, which is, does dietary saturated fat increase blood cholesterol, an informal review of observational studies. But wait a second. I thought he says observational studies are hypothesis generating, not proof. So if, if, if this is hypothesis generating and not proof, then why is he citing these as proof for this idea that saturated fat does not raise blood cholesterol levels? Well, the reason is, is because saturated fat does raise blood cholesterol levels, and this has been shown several times in a randomized controlled trial. Oh, you might ask, is this are these the randomized controlled trials that only last a few weeks? No, they're not only those randomized controlled trials. Those 91 randomized controlled trials, no matter how long they lasted, they showed a decline in blood cholesterol. Those are not those trials. There's actually two long-term randomized controlled trials that lasted over five years. Let's look at some of them. One of them is called uh, a controlled clinical trial of a diet high in unsaturated fat and preventing the complications of atherosclerosis. It was published in 1969 in Circulation, the official journal of the American Heart Association. And in this, it basically says that they had a conventional diet and then they had an experimental diet where they replaced most of those fat calories, about 40% of all the total calories were from fat. They replaced them with uh, uh, polyunsaturated fats to the highest degree, or actually unsaturated fats, to degree, so a mixture of unsaturated fats and polyunsaturated fats. And, and, and they, they looked and saw what the effect was on serum cholesterol and on heart disease. 
And as you can see here, they looked at the serum cholesterol levels over a long period of time, in particular eight years, and they saw that the experimental diet produced a substantial reduction in, in serum cholesterol levels, actually almost, almost 13%. So it appears that saturated fat uh, replacement with polyunsaturated fat replace, uh, uh, re with polyunsaturated fat does cause serum cholesterol levels to decrease. And here you can see, actually, this is a mortality. Or this isn't mortality. This is um, this is, I think, myocardial infarction. So, over the, these eight years, you look at the. the it's not myocardial infarction. Yes, that's mine. Over these eight years, they look at the experimental group and they look at the control group for the rate of myocardial infarction. The control group had about 50% had myocardial infarctions, which is heart attacks, and the experimental group had about 30% had heart attacks. So they also saw a substantial reduction in events as well. That's just icing on the cake here. I just wanted to show that replacement of saturated fats with polyunsaturated fats causes a reduction in blood cholesterol levels. It's been shown in long-term studies. Well, this is a long-term study. He ignores this in his article. He doesn't even mention it, and instead he uses epidemiological studies, which he says himself are not proof of causation, yet he uses them against randomized controlled trials. It's strange. Oh yeah, but there's another randomized controlled trial. It's called the All Slow Diet Heart Study. And it's strange because these are both classic studies. They're extremely well known in the randomized controlled trial literature on cardiovascular disease risk from polyunsaturated fats replacing saturated fats, yet for some reason he doesn't cite them. Hmm. Here's what they showed in this particular study. Over time, actually um, within three months, because it because uh, blood cholesterol levels respond extremely quickly within about a week or two to uh, to changes in fatty acid composition, they saw uh, about a 30% drop, about a 30% drop compared to the control group, 20 to 30% of uh, serum cholesterol. So again, they saw a drastic drop in serum cholesterol whenever they re replaced in a randomized controlled trial saturated fats with polyunsaturated fats, and they also saw, as I pointed out earlier, fatal myocardial infarction, a much, much lower rate in the diet group compared to the control group. So the control group had, say, about a 30% rate of myocardial, uh, fatal myocardial infarction in 11 years, and the diet group had about a, an 8%. So, or sorry, so that more like a, a 20% or a 15 to 20%. So almost a dub, I'm almost halving of the risk of myocardial infarction in response to dietary change, which caused the lower blood cholesterol levels. So then he goes on to say that studies on low carbohydrate diets suggest that they not only don't raise blood cholesterol, but they also have several benefits on cardiovascular disease risk markers. And he cites this one particular study. And of course, you can cite many different meta-analyses, many different studies to show many different things, but I prefer the most definitive, which was published, I think, one or two months ago by the National Lipid Association. They looked at all the meta-analysis, all the studies, and then they concluded that results from meta-analysis demonstrate a variable total uh, cholesterol and low density lipoprotein cholesterol response to low carbohydrate and very low carbohydrate diets. The reason for this is there's a lot of reasons. One of them is that it depends on what you're using as your fat. So if you're using a um, low carb diet with a lot of saturated fats, it tends to increase uh, cholesterol levels. And as it says here, a high saturated fatty acid content in low carbohydrate and very low carbohydrate diets is a key factor. This is from the National Lipid Association, one of the most prestigious, prominent, like, respected organizations on lipids in the world, if not the most respected organization on lipids in the world, certainly in America, they're the most respected. And this review that I'm citing is incredibly comprehensive. It is like a guidebook to low carbohydrate diets and the metabolic effects thereof. Yet it's saying that high saturated fat content in the low carb diet will cause higher blood cholesterol levels um, as compared to a, uh, a low carb diet that's higher, say in nuts and seeds and fiber and, and in that, those kinds of foods compared to animal foods. So this is the National Lipid Association. Um, and if you look at the individual studies themselves, low carb studies, it's very clear that that's the case that the saturated fat composition makes a big difference 
or the fatty acid composition in general, whether it's saturated fat or unsaturated fat, makes a huge difference in the lipid response. And nobody questions that. It's like, it's so obvious. It's based on, we know this from MinSync studies. We know this based on these last two randomized controlled trials I showed you. This is based on a body of literature that is indisputable and it is incredible. It is incredible that Chris Gresser continues to cite things like uh, Steph Stephen Guillenay's blog post about this was, was based on on epidemiological studies and basically Stefan told me when I talked to him about this study and Stefan can chime in if he wants to on this Stefan told me that that whenever he wrote that he was being a little bit arrogant that he didn't really know what he was talking about on this particular issue and I've asked him recently I asked him earlier today if he was going to update this and take this down because that particular blog post that that Chris Kresser cites is not is not legitimate it's not a valid it's not a valid argument. It's it's very misleading, and I hope Stefan takes it down and 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 makes note of that because it's incredible how Chris wants to cite blogs instead of mainstream organizations and mainstream science. He cites blogs to show that mainstream science is forty to fifty years behind. It's incredible because he actually doesn't know what the science says. He's completely clueless. And here's what the recommendations were from the table and the National Lipid um, Association report. And it says that a uh, reduction by weight is highly recommended for achieving metabolic, uh, cardiometabolic risk profile improvement. But it says a little lower grade of evidence and I can't go into exactly what these grades are. I actually don't know right now, but I know they're a little bit lower. It's, it's reasonable for them to choose uh, unsaturated fats over saturated fats. So that means that if you're going to go on a low-carb diet, you should probably try to eat nuts and seeds rather than butter or, 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 or dairy or, um, or fatty meats. And it also says low-carbohydrate diets are reasonable for lowering triglycerides and a bunch of other things about low-carb diets perhaps being helpful for cardiometabolic benefit. But the point is, is that what is known for sure is that improving cardiometabolic profile is is best done through weight loss and a low carb diet might improve things to a certain degree and to the degree that it might improve things to a certain degree uh, beyond weight loss it's also the case that you want to make sure that your fatty acid composition is more unsaturated than saturated so he can ch so somebody like chris could cherry pick and say oh i only want to accept these ones and i don't want to accept this one but according to this particular organization these are at the same level of evidence so you can't, so in, unless you're just willing to cherry pick it, you, you, anybody who wants to say that, that low carb diets are great probably also needs to say that it's better if we use higher unsaturated fats than saturated fats in low carb diets. And so he next says, if you're wondering whether saturated fat may contribute to heart disease in some way that isn't related to cholesterol, it, okay, we've already established that saturated fat does cause higher blood cholesterol levels than polyunsaturated fats, which reduces once you replace saturated fats with them. But he can just go on. He can start talking about this meta-analysis of prospective studies. So it's, it's, these are observational studies. These are not randomized controlled trials. And then he also cites a Japanese study. Well, first of all, I didn't even get this in this particular uh, slideshow, but a large meta-analysis, most meta-analyses of epidemiological studies that look at saturated fat include that they do reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease, at least observationally, they're associated with a reduced risk. Um, so he, he, he's, he's cherry-picked one in particular that suits his particular narrative, but why does he cherry-pick that one over the others? Or is it cherry-picking? Does he have a methodology? And I haven't seen anywhere on his website that posts a methodology about why he chooses this particular meta-analysis over the others that show the, uh, the opposite. And that's basically the problem with Chris Kresser is that he doesn't have a methodology. He just cherry-picks whatever he thinks is like will support his view. And then here it says that it's this Japanese study. It's the same thing. It's, chap it's an observational study, an epidemiological study, a study that he believes isn't valid according to his previous posts, yet now he's showing these epidemiological studies showing that he's right what is it are epidemiological studies valid or not and if they're not valid then why is he showing them to support his point does he only show them to support his point whenever they support his point actually if you look at the randomized controlled trial literature there is a lot of conflicting ran um, meta-analyses of this literature that is the truth but the most gold standard the Cochrane collaboration um, 
a review in meta-analysis of the saturated fat and cardiovascular disease randomized control trial literature concluded that saturated fat reduction replacement with unsaturated fats does reduce cardiovascular disease risk. Now, I don't know if this particular study is better than the others. I don't know the methodology that I would need to use to determine whether Cochrane has a better uh, a, a better design than the other meta-analyses do, but the interesting thing is, is Chris Kresser doesn't know either, and he doesn't ever actually tell us what his methodology and his reasons for choosing one study over the other are. So what, why is it that he chooses studies that don't show an effect um, over the ones that do? Is it because he has a, method, a sophisticated methodological understanding, or is it because he's cherry-picking? So here's, here's the study. It's, you can see that the different groups show a reduction, or the different uh, studies show a reduction in cardiovascular disease risk whenever you have lower unsaturated fats or higher unsaturated fats and lower saturated fats and then basically you end up with almost a 20 percent reduction in uh, combined cardiovascular events if you combine all of these studies now there are some studies that are excluded here and there's reasons that they were excluded and i don't i can't go into detail about why that is because i don't know i'm not an expert in this particular area but i've never seen chris point out why he, we would use another meta analysis over this one my understanding is the reason those other studies are excluded is because they have design problems. Now, this is a very modest effect. It's only about 20%. It's less than 20%. Well, why is that? Well, the reason is the saturated fat and LDL cholesterol is not the only thing that determines heart disease risk. A lot of other things determine heart disease risk. And if you only have elevated LDL cholesterol, it's not the only... It's actually... And if you have nothing else going on, it's actually not the end of the world. It's not the biggest deal in the world. You could have much, much, much worse risk, like a hundredfold worse, worse risk if you had, say, diabetes, you're smoking, hypertension, you're male, you're old. All of those different things actually lend to much higher risk in those particular situations. So LDL isn't the be-all, end-all of cardiovascular disease risk. That's why you see a very modest effect, in some ways borderline effect, of reduction of saturated fat on heart disease risk. The way that nutrition and health work is it's many factors coming together that, that ultimately reduces risk and causes the best outcomes. It's not one factor. And you, if you look at probably any one particular health factor in, and they're associated with cardiovascular disease, including inflammation and insulin sensitivity, insulin resistance, you're not going to see a huge association. And certainly you're not going to see one, one that's larger than LDL. So that's why you've got the modest effects there, because all of these factors are modest by themselves. And he says, another strike against the diet harp hypothesis is that many of its original opponents haven't believed it for at least two decades. In a letter to the New England Journal of Medicine in 1991, Ansel Keys, the founder of the diet harp hypothesis, said, diet, dietary cholesterol has an important effect on cholesterol level in blood of chickens and rabbits, but many controlled experiments have shown that dietary cholesterol has a limited effect in humans. Adding cholesterol to a cholesterol-free diet raises the blood level in humans, but when added to an unrestricted diet, it has a minimal effect. So... I mentioned that earlier, vegans versus omnivores, you add cholesterol, there's a different, there's a different outcome in vegans versus omnivores. Similarly, in that particular meta-analysis that I showed, it showed that the change in dietary cholesterol at the lower levels caused much larger changes in blood cholesterol levels than changes in dietary cholesterol at the higher levels of intake. He's just saying that, but what, what Chris is trying to imply that Ansel Keys is saying here, he's trying to imply that Ansel Keys rejects the diet heart hypothesis. But when you actually go look at the paper, once again, that Chris is using, it doesn't say that at all. Actually, it says that, it says that uh, basically Keyes is really upset at this particular paper because it's a letter to the editor and it's like a, it's like a paragraph long. And he says, um, he says, the paper, you know, it's, it's received considerable publicity with news reports, blah, 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 and it doesn't discriminate between cholesterol in the diet and that in the blood, meaning cholesterol in the blood is important, cholesterol in the diet might not be so important. He says, adding cholesterol to cholesterol-free diet raises it in humans, but has, to an unrestricted diet has a minimal effect. Okay, whatever. Um, publicizing the story of a man who ate 25 eggs a day will ultimately confuse the public and instill skepticism about nutritional teaching, an area which emphasis on the fatty acids in the diet is needed. What is he saying there? He's saying that it's important to actually notice the fatty acids in the diet, not the dietary cholesterol, meaning the saturated fats, the polyunsaturated fats, the monounsaturated fats, dietary cholesterol has a much lower effect. And so whenever we think about the relationship between cardiovascular disease and 
and blood cholesterol levels, the most important variable is not dietary cholesterol, but saturated fat. In other words, what Keyes is saying is diet higher hypothesis is really important. It's just not saturated fat that's important. And it hasn't been 20 years, as he's been saying, that, that he's believed that. He says, original opponents haven't believed it in two decades. In the 1950s or 1960s, Keyes was saying this. Keyes was pointing out that saturated fat is the important thing, not dietary cholesterol. He didn't believe that um, very early on in his career, that dietary cholesterol was that important. And the whole diet heart hypothesis that Keyes established is on the basis of saturated fat, not on cholesterol has nothing to do with cholesterol at the beginning. But the thing is, is Chris can leave out all these, this context and he can, and he can cherry pick and he can take, and he can take um, different quotations out of their original context to make it look like uh, Ansel Keys is saying he rejects the diet, diet heart hypothesis whenever he never rejected the diet heart hypothesis, whenever um, Ansel Keys' work is still widely celebrated in the uh, biomedical scientific community and, um, and, and people who read these kinds of blogs think they're crazy. Like they think guys like Chris Kresser are crazy. I think Chris Kresser is, is somewhere between stu like unintelligent and crazy. I don't understand h how a person could write such things and, 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 like, and like take, the, take it seriously what they're writing. I don't understand how somebody could do that because it's so outrageous the, the, the way that he's presenting this information. And he says, we've now established that eating cholesterol and saturated fat do not increase cholesterol levels in the blood for most people. In this article, I'll debunk the myth that high cholesterol in the blood is the cause of heart disease. Heart disease. So he, he's now going to debunk the myth that high cholesterol in the blood is the cause of heart disease. When we've just seen that able B to A1 ratio, which is an indication of high LDL levels in the blood, is the best correlate of heart disease. And there's nobody in the lipids community there's no living there's like there's like one scientist in france like like m like there's nobody who's been trained in lipids as far as i know except for like one person in the world who questions that ldl causes heart disease most people thinking that ldl cholesterol don't doesn't cause heart disease were not trained in lipids they're people who are dabbling in this area and don't know what they're talking about so it <laughs> I look forward to this next article. I look forward to this next article, which, which apparently shows that high cholesterol in the blood is, is not the cause of heart disease, whereas all of the articles he's actually been showing, trying to, sh to cite to show that dietary cholesterol and saturated fat don't elevate blood cholesterol levels, all of these articles have all been arguing that high cholesterol in the blood is the cause of heart disease. So he's picking from those particular articles that the thing he's, he likes and then ignoring the other things. Let's look actually at this little... Uh, uh, bubble that he put at the end of his article. It says, Reach your spotlight. Health coaching and heart health. Behavioral counseling dose dependently improves lipid levels. Okay. Oxidated, oxidized uh, low density lipoprotein cholesterol plays a critical role in the development of cardiovascular disease. High circulating levels of LDL cholesterol r increase the likelihood that LDL may become oxidized, contributing to c uh, CVD pathogenesis, basically treating heart disease. Wait, so it's saying high levels of LDL cholesterol increase the likelihood that LDL may become oxidized? So he's basically saying LDL cholesterol is important for cardiovascular disease? High levels? Um, a diet and lifestyle change has been found to reduce LDL cholesterol, but many changes have trouble sustaining these over the long term. Okay. It's just incredible. Like, why does he even talk about all of this in his whole article and how blood cholesterol levels aren't important for cardiovascular disease, but then he's talking about how LDL levels here are uh, increase, the, increase the chance of getting oxidized LDL cholesterol and causing heart disease. It doesn't even make any sense. It's like, it's like two people put together this web page and they didn't actually check with each other like what they were actually writing. And let me point out, this is what most of his stuff reads like. It makes me so upset to read it. But I don't say anything about it because Whenever I get on the internet and read these kinds of articles, I just, I'm just like, you know what, this is everywhere. You have to pick your battles and I have to finish my PhD. I don't have time to constantly look at Chris Kresser's crazy stuff and, and, and refute it. And I'm only doing it because he's going on Joe Rogan and I want people to understand he's not a credible person to, to be talking to. He's not a credible person to be talking about game changers. He's, he'll probably do pretty well in criticizing the movie. There were a lot of problems in that particular film. There is a lot of problems, but he's not credible. And this article is only just like a tiny slice of all the BS that he puts out on a regular basis. Other things he talks about is 
uh, that, that, that type 1 diabetes might be reversible. Type 1 diabetes might be reversible? You know how many people that idea kills all the time? You know how old that myth has been that, that, that type 1 diabetes might be reversible? You know that people who promote the ketogenic diet promote that idea and then people who have type 1 diabetes stop taking their insulin thinking that they're going to reverse their type 1 diabetes and die? Do you know that, do you know that uh, raw vegans do the same thing and tell type 1 diabetes that kind of thing? You know why this is the case? Is because whenever you have a, a, diet, a diet ideology and you think and you think that is like the human diet. You start thinking that it can do magical things. And this is what Chris Kresser thinks, and this is why he writes these kinds of things on his website. He also writes about glyphosate and about like how glyphosate's killing everybody. He doesn't even know how to, he doesn't understand how to systematically um, interpret science. And it's, it's really disappointing because a lot of people are reading his stuff. Apparently, according to his Huffington Post profile, f something like 400,000 people a month read his stuff. Um, he, he's been cited in many magazines as being a ver an incredibly influential person in the health space. That's really sad because he's increasing people's disease risk and he's causing people who listen to him to die. So, so, so that's why that's why I get upset about this. I don't have time to do this. This is a big waste of my time, and this person isn't arguing with. And I would and I would probably I would never have a debate with him because it's just not it wouldn't be worth my time to do it. But. Um, and it's also, I, I would just be, I wouldn't be able to talk with him in, in a civilized way. Because I, I don't think he's civilized. I don't think somebody who could write these things and, and tell people, tell people these kinds of things with such a level of arrogance, I think he's just really disconnected from, from science and from, in a certain sense, from modernity and civilization itself. He's just really out there. So it's 1040. I'm going to go to bed. Thank you for watching.